All right. Thank you for that. We're looking forward to it. One announcement. There's some baked goods for sale out to the service tonight. All the proceeds will go to the Serving with Heart Ministry. I should know what that is. It's in the school? Okay, thank you. That's right. And you told me about that. I'm sorry. Uh, they, they're, 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 some of the teenagers in the school came up with this, right? They want to raise a little money to help a needy family for Thanksgiving. And so I, I appreciate that. And uh, that's almost Christian. Um, so I'm sure it's good baked goods, so go out there and get some. Acts chapter number 3. We're not going to be long. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you for about 20 minutes kind of related to Friend Day and how we can help people. And then what we're going to do at the end, we're going to pass out a little prayer list sheet. I'll go over that, and we'll spend a few minutes together just simply praying for God's favor on what happens on Friend Day. Acts chapter 3, an interesting story here. It says, now, G Peter and John went up to pray, went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the tables, in, entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, he wanted some money. He needed help. And Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, he must have been a Baptist. Silver and gold have I none, okay? But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, my, why marvel you at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness... We had made this man to walk. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. I pray you bless the brief message. Help us to be prepared for this Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the story, these are the early days of the church. And so, uh, Peter, Peter's go, they're going into the, Peter and John, they're going into the temple to, to pray, the time of prayer. And as they go there, there's a, a man who can't walk, and he's, he's asking, begging for alms. He needs help, and and. Peter looks at him and says, look on us. Now, if you're begging, you're asking for money, when someone stops to talk to you, you would think, here we go. This is someone that's going to give me something. Now, that hope was immediately dashed when Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none. By the way, every person here, I guarantee at one time or another, someone asked you for money and you said, I don't have money, right? How many have ever done that? Okay, hope, I hope you didn't lie, all right? Uh, I was with somebody one time, and they weren't real nice to him. They're like, well, no, go get a job. I'm like, okay, that, that was helpful. Um, but, but so he looks at us and says, we don't have money. He goes, but what we do have, we're going to give to you. And he healed the man right there on the spot. And then they run, in, they run into the temple, and they run around, and everybody catches on. And as they see this guy with Peter and John, and they're jumping around and praising God, and they're like, they knew that guy couldn't walk before. And they knew something wonderful had happened, and they all gather around, and Peter says, oh, that's an opportunity. Let's preach to him, and let's tell him what's going on. And so he does. This here, I love this. This is a great picture of the purpose of the church and really the purpose of Christians. Helping others, reaching out to others, seeing, by the way, seeing past the need that they portray to the real need that they have. Now, there are times, and I know we can't just give everybody money that asks for it because the fact of the matter is, we've been burned. I bought people food, and you, 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 they want money for food, and I don't, I'm not going to give them money. I don't know what they're doing with it, but if they want food, I bought them food, and they're like, I don't want your food, and they walk away. It's like, well, that was, they wanted the money for something else. 
But you know, sometimes there are people, people with legitimate needs. But even if they're asking for money for food, they have a deeper need than that. This man had a greater need, and he was healed and helped. Each and every day of our lives, fact of the matter is, God brings us in contact with people who have greater needs. Oh, it could be someone that drives a nice car. It could be someone that has a place to live. Uh, it could be someone that seems to have it all together. They're dressed nicely and all of that. But the fact of the matter is, deep down inside, we don't know what's going on. Okay? And they might have a need. And fact of the matter is, yeah, a lot of people, they won't take your invitations or whatever, but a lot of people will. And even if, they're, even if there's only one out of a thousand, it's worth it to find that one. And so people have great needs. How, here, we see some of the qualities in how Peter was able to be helpful and how we can be helpful. And in the few minutes I got left, I just want to touch on a few. What are some of these qualities in Peter's life? Well, first of all, I want you to notice it was a spiritual life. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. What were they doing? They were going to the temple, the place that they were supposed to be at. And as we look at these men, we know they, were, they, were, they, they weren't perfect. We just got on Peter on Sunday night a little bit. Not on Peter, we got on ourselves, all right? Uh, but, but these men were doing the spiritual thing they were supposed to be doing. And because of that, they were able to see this man there that needed help. Understand this, we cannot help others if we are not being helped ourselves. Okay, the first step, to be honest, if we're going to really make a difference in somebody's life, we need to be the kind of person that God's making a difference in our life. Or else we have nothing to give. Now, I understand. I've been around long enough to know some people that's li that, that their lives weren't together. And for whatever reason, they'd invite people and people would come to church. Now, if those people got help, they weren't getting help from those, that guy. But, but well, for whatever reason. But the fact of the matter is if we're going to have relationships and really be able personally to help somebody, God's got to be working in our life. And if he's not working in our life, we can't do anything for anybody else. Let me ask you, are you do you struggle? Is there any aspects of the Christian life you struggle with you, to be faithful? Oh, by the, I'm not talking about the facade you throw out on the outside. I'm talking about who you really are. Who you are when you are alone. Is God, do, what do you struggle with? You're struggling with your Bible reading. You're struggling with, with any aspect of life. You need to get that settled with God so that you can have God working in you. And by the way, when God is working in you, you'll be excited to see him work in others. Yeah. Say, well, I'm just not really that concerned. I just like coming to church, and I, I like the friendships and the people I have here, but I'm, I'm not really, you know, I'm, just, I'm focused in on only me right now. And I'm not saying we don't help people as God's working with us. We can start work. We can start. Listen, you know the one who usually brings the most visitors is the newer convert. They're just they're just on fire. Now they don't have everything. Look, they don't have all the eyes dotted. They don't have all the T's crossed. But they know something's going on, and they want other people to have a part in that. But the point is this: Let's have God work in our life. We face a spiritual battle every day, and we need strength. Look at the verses there in Ephesians. Goes through everything. He says, "Finally, my brethren." He's getting to the end of the book. Be strong in the Lord. No, I want to be long, strong. Okay, here, how do you do that? And in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen, the things that we face in our life, there's a power behind them that is far greater than anything we could throw together. The fact of the matter is, in the age and the times in which we live, that power is more dark than ever. And we're not going to make it on our own. Everything in here is his strength, his power, his, his protection. Put on his armor. What is God doing in your life? 
Because if you allow God to do something in your life, you will want to share that with somebody else. He lived a spiritual life. Secondly, he lived a sacrificial life. Then Peter said in verse 6, and we joke about it, but the fact of the matter is, it was true. Silver and gold have I none. Okay? Following Jesus, uh, contrary to what Joel Osteen will say, is not the path to prosperity. Now, it's the path to provision. It's the path to peace. It's a path to all those things. But not necessarily. God doesn't promise you wealth because you follow him. Now, Peter was a businessman before. He had his own fishing business. But he gave that up for the Lord. And he was willing to sacrifice that for something greater. What did he sacrifice it for? Follow me, Peter. All those guys, fishermen. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Something more important than fishing for fish. Something more important than that business he had. Fishing for men. And he was willing to sacrifice to do that. What do we really sacrifice to help others? And I know some in here, your younger ones, I hope you're open to what God wants you to do in the future. Maybe God will call you to sacrifice having a career and all of that to do something for him. But all of us are, 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 are called to sacrifice whatever to help others. Time, effort, okay, emotions. I mean, that's what it takes. Are we willing to sacrifice to help others? By the way, serving God, whether you do it Full, we, like, we say full-time or just serving God through ministry in the church and looking for opportunities in your life. All of us are called to do that. Now, in our, in our discipleship series we've been going through, if we would have did it this week, we're right in the middle of that. Okay? But look at the verses. We'll look at this next week again with a couple others. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, I know that. I'm not saved by anything I do. Okay, but, but now he's going to talk about what you do in verse 10. For we are his workmanship. That means a, a new product created in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What did we say last week? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good. Okay. Are we willing to? To sacrifice, it takes time, and I understand it. I appreciate everybody that comes early to be on a bus route. I appreciate uh, parking attendants, and that's not really exciting. No car is going to pull over and, and give you a hug. All right, if you get in the way, they might run you over the way some of you I've seen you folks drive. You know, greeting and being in Sunday school and bringing food and teaching children, working in the nursery, whatever it is, being in the choir. If you play an instrument, being in the Lord, and that takes time, and I get it, and that's a sacrifice, and God's, God, God, God's thankful for that. But that's what it takes if we're going to help somebody. Number three, it was a selfless life. Peter said unto him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Peter was willing to give him that which he knew he could give him, which would help him which really is of himself, in and of himself. We think giving is, you know, dropping a couple bucks in an offering plate every now and then. Peter says, you know, I, I got something better I want to give you. Now, as we mentioned, if you don't have it yourself, you can't give it. It's a selfless life. We must hurry. Number four, it was a sharing life. I like this. Silver and gold, such as I have, give I thee. What did he, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It wasn't one of these lame faith healing lie things you see on television. Yeah. The guy breathes on you and you fall over. Well, that says something. Okay? So that's not a miracle. That's a lack of mouthwash. All right? That's what that is. It's not like slapping someone on the forehead or speaking with gibberish and then, you know, they, they pass out. Next thing you know, they're healed. He knew where the healing came from. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he shared with him the only one who could help him to get up 
and start walking. By the way, that's what we do. We want to share with people the one who can give them life. And not just eternal life, abundant life. Not just a place in heaven, but a purpose on earth. That only comes through Jesus Christ. And if they don't get connected to him, they're not getting anything. Okay? This isn't, we give away the gift cards just as a way of thanking people for coming early. Okay? But that, look at coffee bean, sorry, Alvaro, it's not going to change your life. Now, it'll enhance it. Okay? But it's not going to change our life. Knowing Jesus Christ will change their life. And I hope it's a friend that you're inviting that you're, you're close to or you know somewhat, somewhat that you follow up a little deeper than that. We've got to connect them to Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, Paul said. Nevertheless, I live. He says, I, I, was, I was crucified with him, but I'm still alive. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, how I'm living now, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able to exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that work, worketh in us. I mean, that's the kind of God we serve. He can do more than we ask for and we even think could happen. And we want to share that with them. Number five, it was a strengthening life. I like this. I like a lot of it. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. He didn't say, all right, Jesus says you can be healed. Jump up, buddy. Let's do this. Now, he could have. I know there's times Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, okay? Peter wasn't Jesus. So he was just showing him who Jesus was. But he, he helps him to get up. Because I'm sure if the guy's laying there, even if he felt something, he's thinking, can I really do this? I've never done this before. And Peter's encouraging him that he, he can do it, but he's like, I'm going to help you get up. You know what people, you know a lot of people need if they're going to live the Christian life, they need someone to say, let me bring you, let me bring you along. Because it's new to them. They have no idea. Man, when I went to church, I thought, it's a bunch of weird people. Okay? They didn't look like me. You know, they didn't sing the songs I liked. They were obvious, now they were great people, they were kind and and, and when I got saved and I started reading my Bible, and I'm like, I want to I do this thing. How do you do it? I mean, you, I know it's, you start, you know, you listen to preaching, and I'm, I'm trying to do those things. But I was glad there was people that grabbed my hand. Fiz no, literally. They'd share things with me. You know? I was talking to prayer with one of the men in the church, and he's like, and he's encouraged me, and talking to me about it. And then he gives me a book to read, like, read this book, Prayer is Asking by John R. Rice. That'll help you. And gave me other things. You know, let's not get so caught up in ourselves here that we don't help others. Amen. And by the way, I know we have things we have to deal with on a daily basis. But don't let that stop us from helping others. Amen. Reaching them. Sometimes they need someone to just grab them and help them to come up. You know what it takes? A personal touch. I don't have time for it here, but, but in the early days of the church, you know, pastor, I, I was working with the teenagers, and pastor said, why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't you start a singles ministry? We didn't really have singles. We had a bunch of young people and a bunch of old Cambodian folks. And so we started. And two of the first four weeks, the only people in the class were my wife and I. It was kind of cool. It was date time, you know. We looked in the room. I looked at her, like, hey. Okay, well, I'm not going to teach you the lesson. You already know it, so come sit closer, you know. It's... But the class, we had a few people, and it started to grow. We got up to about a month. We had nine or ten people. And then what we did is we were over here on um, Anaheim, and, and we didn't have any Sunday school space. My wife and I lived two blocks away, so we started having Sunday school in our apartment house. They like that. I didn't. At that time, I was the kind of guy, you don't come to my house ever. 
my house is our house, and I ain't having you guys over. They didn't think like that. And I, Sunday morning, I'd be up in my room, and I'd take a shower, and I'd come out, and like, it's an hour before Sunday school's going to start, and we'd have 15 people in there reading the newspaper back in the day when they read the newspaper, eating my breakfast, and hanging out. I'm like, what is going on here? And I found out something. They like relationships. They didn't want me just to get up and teach. And I'm not kidding. In two months' time, we went from like 10 people to 35 and 40 in my living room. Like, what are all the... And then it wasn't just on Sundays. They just figured, I know where you live. I'm coming. I remember one time we, we had dinner. And we had a little porch out in the back, and we started barbecuing. And it was just our family. Next thing you know, there's like five or six Cambodian singles at my house. And I kid you not, Pastor Esposito came by and knocked on my door. I'm like, what, did you see the smoke signals and you came running for free food? He's like, no, I just, I had to, I was in the area, I had to ask you a question. All right. But, you know, I realized something. That's what it took to make an impact. Amen. They had that relationship. And, and, and they'd come on Friday, every Friday night. Every Friday night. And this is when the thing really blew up. They'd come to our house, and they were at our house from 6 at night till 3 in the morning, every Friday night. We would go bowling, we'd go eat somewhere, and we'd go to my house to play games. By the way, several of those couples got married, not there in the house, but, okay? But you know what it took? It took a little more, of, and I learned something. You've got to have a little more of a personal touch if you're going to help somebody. You've got to be willing to be there with them. You've got to be willing to have that connection. And then lastly, it was a seeking life. Verse 4, and Peter fastening his eyes upon him. And then in verse 12, and when Peter saw it, he answered the people. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean, Peter saw the opportunity. He's walking by and he sees this guy begging and he's like, there's an opportunity right there for this guy to get healed. And then when the crowd gets together and like, what's going on here? Peter looked at him and said, here's my opportunity to stand up and tell him what Christ can do. Do we look for those opportunities? I mean, there's people out there, if you talk to them, they'll tell you about something going on in their life. It's like, I, I can't be bothered with that right now. Well, you better be. It's an opportunity. All right, let's pray.